Hello, everyone. We are live here on the David Irie Foundation page. We're at episode number 18, going to bat with Team Irie. If you haven't seen some of the other previous uh, interviews, you can go back, scroll down on the foundation page. And then with some of the events that we planned, you know, for this fall, if we're allowed to do those, you can check those out on this page or also on our website, which is dif35.org. And we also give to spinal cord injury research and high school baseball scholarships. So you can donate, you know, by going to our Facebook page or our website tonight. We're honored to have Mr. Johnny LeMaster. How you done tonight, Johnny? Doing great, David. Glad to be here, man. Uh, I hear you got a great show. I hope, hopefully I won't drag it down for you. Oh, no, you're perfect. Uh, you know, we're excited to have you. I'm humbled that you, you know, decide to come on here. And uh, we've been friends for a little while, which we can get into that a little later. But, uh, yeah, I really appreciate you coming on here and uh, talking a little baseball since we don't have any baseball. And, you know, you were one of the greats. You played for 12 seasons. And uh, would you care to talk a little bit about, like, your journey up to the major leagues and how you got there? I'd be glad to. Uh, I started out, you know, when I was in the eighth grade, uh, Gene Bennett, I'm sure, I don't know whether you've had him on the show or not, but he's passed away now. But he he was a scout with the Reds. When I was in the eighth grade, he <clears throat> saw me play and handed me one of his cards and said he was going to follow me. And then all the way through high school, when I was a junior and senior, there'd be 20 or 30 scouts at every game that I played. And when I graduated in uh, 1973, uh I was very fortunate to be the San Francisco Giants' number one uh, first-round draft choice. Uh, was the sixth player taken in the nation that year. And I spent uh, what they call a half season or the rookie league season in 73 at Great Falls, Montana. And then uh, the next year I started out in A-ball uh, in Decatur, Illinois. Halfway through that season, they called me up to Fresno, California. And then the next year, I, I completely skipped double A and went to triple A in Phoenix, Arizona. And at the end of that season, when they have their uh, 40-man roster, or they expand the roster at the end of the season in September of 1975, I was called up to the big leagues. And I was very fortunate. It, it was a pretty fast process for me. Uh, I was – I had signed a college scholarship to play at Arizona State, and but I turned it down to sign with the Giants. But by the time that I, I would have been starting my junior year in college, I was already in the big leagues. So I was very fortunate. I was going to ask you, was it hard getting to the major league level, but you got up through there pretty quick. I did. I, I, I got up through there very, I, I don't know what you call it, the express lane or, or what, but it it seemed like it was one day I was drafted and the next day I was in, in San Francisco. Did you ever get any good advice, like, from a player while you were in the major leagues or, or you know, because you stayed there for 12 years or was it just your worth ethic that kept you there? Well, there were a few, like, Willie McCovey was – one of the guys that you would go and talk to and he, you know, he set me down when you first came up and he, he would say, just be yourself. Don't try to impress anybody or do anything that you're not capable of doing. And, and he was kind of a, uh, a guy on the team that everybody looked up to anyway. When he comes and sits down and talks with you, it kind of, makes you stand up at attention and listen very hard to what he's going to say. And, and, but I always try to take his advice to, uh, to mind. And, and it was very good advice that he always did give me. There, there was one day that I was sitting in my locker and uh, it was after a game was over. And here comes this gray haired man walking in the, uh, clubhouse and it was Joe DiMaggio and he walked in the clubhouse see he, he lived in San Francisco was where he lived and 
he walked straight through the clubhouse that didn't stop. He came over to my locker and sat down beside me. You know, I was shocked. I knew who he was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he sat down beside me and he said, he said, you know what? He, he said, I love the way you play. He said, you play the game where it's supposed to be played. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, you go out there and you run everything out. You run in and out on in between innings and, and you run ground balls out. And he said, I love the way you play. And, but when a man of that stature comes over and just sits down beside of you and says something like that, you, you almost feel like you're on cloud nine. Yeah, I think I would have passed out. I don't know if Joe DiMaggio sat beside me. And you're talking about Willie McCovey and these guys. I mean, it, you know, for us laymen, I guess, these guys that never played on that level, just hearing these net, those names and thinking about, you know, how, what an honor it would have been to play with those guys. I mean, it, it's pretty astonishing. It's, uh, you know, it's, sometimes I still got to pinch myself to see whether it was true or not, whether I played in the big leagues or not or whether I knew McCovey or was able to talk to a man like Joe DiMaggio, which I think at that time to me, he was a living legend, although he's passed away. He's still, he's a legend to anybody that knows anything about baseball. Yep. You're exactly right. And you know, when you got to the major leagues, I was reading you, I did a little research on everybody and, uh, and your first at bat at that time was the second time. I don't know if it, you know, you know how many people's done this since, but, your first at bat was pretty astounding. <laughs> it was a little crazy. Uh, I just got called up from AAA. We flew in that morning. It was a day game. And it was a Sunday afternoon day game against the Dodgers, which was the Giants' arch rivalries. So I, I get there, and the other guys, two guys that got called up with me, we were getting our uni uniforms issued to us, and – we didn't get their time for batting practice or infield or anything like that because we were just getting off of an airplane. And by the time, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, hey, I'm getting to watch a big league baseball game from the dugout. I'm excited as I can be. And finally get out, the game gets ready to start. I don't have my shoes tied uh, uh, my, my glove. I, I'm, just, I'm just ready to sit back and kick back and, and watch the, the, the San Francisco Giants and the Dodgers play. But the shortstop there at that time was Chris Spire. And his first at bat, he pulled a hamstring running down the first base line. And I thought, sure, you know, Bill Rigney was the manager. I thought some of the utility infielders that were already there would have uh, been ones that he called on. But he, he said, LeMaster, get your glove and get in there. So – here, I don't have my shoes tied, and you know how veterans are. <clears throat> they mm -hmm. hid my glove on me. I couldn't find my glove. So by the time I get out to shortstop, the pitcher's already warmed up. I don't even get to throw a ball over to first base, so I'm just out there cold turkey. Oh, my God. But luckily, there wasn't a ball hit to me. Uh, and But here we go. It finally comes around for my first time at bat. There's a Hall of Famer that's on the mound. His name's Don Sutton. And he throws me a curveball, man, that broke about three feet. <clears throat> I swing at it, and I missed it by three feet. <laughs> There's a guy right behind the home plate. He's got all this Dodger stuff on. But we're playing at Candlestick Park. But he don't care. He's hollering, hey, LaMaster, this is the big league. And I, Sutton throws me another curveball. It breaks four feet, and I miss it by four feet. So here I am, 0 and 2, and that guy's still back there right behind home plate. LeMaster, this is, I said, you ain't just a kid. And I said, where'd that kind of curveball come from? <laughs> but for some reason, <clears throat> he tried to knock me off the plate, which most of your big league, when they get you 2 they try to dust you off a little bit and back you away from the plate so they can go to the outside part of the plate. But he got the fastball over the plate, and I hit a line drive uh, dead center field. There was a runner on second, 
His name was Von Joshua. I don't know whether you remember him or not, but uh, he scores. But the line drive, the the center fielder was coming in to play it on one hop to try to make a play on the runner coming from second base. But it hits a seam in the outfield, bounces about 15 feet over his head and rolls all the way to the center field wall. And to this day, I have never run that fast in my life. Uh, but I touched every single base perfect and came into home plate standing up. My first major league at bat was an inside the park home run against the Dodgers at, at Candlestick Park. So that's a way to start your career off right there. Oh, my gosh. That's like a storybook uh, story there. It's hard to believe. And then especially against the Dodgers because – when you become a uh, San Francisco giant, I think you got to sign a contract that you don't like the Dodgers. Well, it's it's when we were in the minor leagues, I know, Hank Sauer, uh, he's a guy that won the MVP when he was playing with the Cubs one year, but he was one of our instructors. And this is one of the things that he said to us. He said, we don't care if you lose every single game that you play as long as you beat the Dodgers every game that you play. <laughs> But, uh, I, you know, when you when you get your first base hit, they try to get the ball back into you and give it to you. And I got the baseball, and I, I've got Don Sutton to sign it for me. Wow. And he wrote – I mean, he wrote a really nice note on there. That Don Sutton is a great guy. I, I don't, don't get me wrong. We hated each other when we played against each other. But when we see each other uh, playing golf tournaments or some type of celebrity, something, he's he's a great guy to be around. That's awesome. That really is. We've got, I don't know if you can see any of the comments on the side, but you got Adam Lee Shaft, it looks like. Hey, Coach LeMaster, looking forward to this. Uh, you've got Kevin Gray. He's asking, what was your favorite ballpark to play in besides Candlestick? It was Wrigley Field. Uh, I'm going to, the Cubs have the best fans in, in the world, not America, but the world. They could be losing 106 games a year, but Wrigley Field would still be full of fans, full of people. And it's, it's amazing what goes on around the ballpark, uh, before the game starts and after the ballpark, when the game's over. But the Cub fans and Wrigley Field is just a, a, a great place to play. Now, when I played with the Oakland A's, I got to go to Fenway Park. And Fenway and Wrigley are neck and neck. But I played in the National League, so I, I love going to Wrigley Field. Yeah, those are some parks. I mean, I you know, that's only that person can only dream about playing in those. And for you to get the opportunity to do it, I mean, it's – I mean, that that's unbelievable. We have uh, Brandon Walker here. He's talking about your stories. That's amazing about Joe DiMaggio. Scott Ratliff says, a great coach. You taught me a lot about a baseball, uh, but even more about how to be a better Christian man. Truly love this man. Talking, Brandon Walker is talking about uh, Jim DiMaggio, 56-game hitting streak. is dang near impossible to do, on, even on the MLB, the show. And then you got Kevin Gray. He's the Beachwood coach up there. He says uh, – a compliment like that from Jody Maggio is incredible. You got Tommy Posey here that uh, uh, used to be the coach down in Mason County. He's a Cub Scout, uh, Chicago Cub Scout. Now he said, who is the best second baseman to work with? The best one I ever worked with was Joe Morgan. Uh, I got to play three years with him. And when he signed with the Giants, uh, I told our equipment manager, I said, you put his locker next to my locker. And the equipment manager did that. <clears throat> so I could talk with him before the game. I could talk with him after the game. But the three years that I played with Joe, I gained 20 years of experience. Because that guy knew the game inside and out. It was unbelievable what he knew about the game of baseball that I could just sit there at his feet and listen to the wisdom just pour out of his mouth. And, but it, he was definitely the best second baseman I ever played with. 
that's really good. I met Joe Morgan down to uh, Great American Ballpark there a couple years ago, and you know he's a nice guy. I took a picture with him, and they were talking about his memory. They said his memory is incredible, so he never forgets anything. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you a story about Joe Morgan. Okay. Uh, we were in Dodger Stadium, and we had me and him had just finished our BP, and we were in changing our undershirts and going to put on another jersey. But he, he said, "John," he said, "He said, sit down here." I said, "What? What's going on?" He said, "I got to tell somebody." So it was just me and him in the locker room, and he he said the Houston Astros have asked me to be their manager. And he was actually playing at that time with the Giants, but they had already contacted him wanting to be. And I said, Joe, I said, you know, I don't want you to go. I said, but if you've got that kind of opportunity, I said, you can't turn it down. And he said, well, he said, the only way I'm going to go is, is that they'll let me be the manager and have the strings that I can pull as a general manager also. And he, he told them that, and, and they didn't want him to be the general manager also, so he turned it down. But it, a lot of people don't know that. But he would have been one of the greatest managers in baseball that there ever would have been if he would have took the job. Yep, you're exactly right. And no, I didn't know that either. So those kind of stories I love to hear, especially about – Major League Baseball players and Joe Morgan, of course, Big Red Machine. You know, we grew up watching the Big Red Machine, and of course, we love Joe Morgan and the and the Big Red Machine. Uh, you played baseball for twelve years or twelve seasons. The longevity of that, do you kind of credit that to your speed, your defense? How did you stay in the major leagues for so long? Well, getting to the major leagues is not easy, <clears throat> but staying there <clears throat> is a lot harder people don't realize how many people literally come and go overnight uh, in the major leagues. But, and you don't stay there on luck. You have to be doing something. And I was very fortunate that I had the, uh, uh, my teammates respected me, uh, my owner respected me, and the <clears throat> managers that I played for respected me, I, I think, because of the way I played the game, the way I tried to talk in the clubhouse, uh, on the field, off the field. But defense was definitely the best part of my game. Uh, and if you can take runs away from the, the other team and, and you've got a good arm, then you're going you're gonna to stay in the big leagues a while. Nowadays, it's, it's, it's definitely different. Most of your shortstops are, are power hitters now. Uh, back when I played, it wasn't that what. But longevity is – is uh, I don't know whether people realize that there's five or six shortstops drafted every single year, that, and you're fighting them off, and there's free agency, and there's trades that can happen, and uh, it, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, but if you played 12 years in the big leagues, you've done something, I'll tell you that, because you don't do it on luck. No, you don't. And I think about Davey Concepcion and uh, Daryl Cheney, some of the guys back then that wasn't really power hitters. But today, you know, they stayed in there for a while. But today, the, the game's changed so much. It has. There's no doubt about that. I, I, and I think it's changed for the good. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I was showing a I put something on Facebook a couple of days ago uh, that showed a Cincinnati Red player in the 72 World Series. Just He did a side body block into the Oakland A's second baseman, and and the second baseman didn't say nothing, and the umpire, nobody was fighting. Nobody was, it was just the way the game was played back then. But, uh, but I can understand they're not wanting to get people's legs broke or anything like that, but uh, – but the, the, the game has changed, some for the better, some for the worst. You got Adam Leeshaft that said, played for coach at Pikeville from 02 to 06, loved every minute of it, still never got to play golf with him, though. <laughs> <laughs> then you got, then you got John you, Porter here in Pine. Get his, get his clubs and come on down here to Pinesville and we'll play tomorrow. <laughs> there you go. You heard it here first, Adam. And then you've got uh, John Holder, which is his son, Sammy, coach up here in Lewis County now. He says, uh, 
thanks for coming on the show tonight, Coach. And then we got Sue Corns here watching tonight. Hello, Sue. You got uh, Frank Conley. He said played four years and coached uh, one with Coach Lamaster at Pikeville College. Can't say enough good things about him. And then Scott Ratliff says joined late and might have already discussed it, but have have him talk about trying to coach a pop up or trying to catch a pop up at Candlestick Adventure. <laughs> Yeah, that hey, I, I, I there was a third baseman that played for the Atlanta Braves. Uh, I'll think of his name. He played at the, during the Dale Murphy time. Uh, he was a good home run hitter. But every time he came to Candlestick, the pop up came went up around third base. He has never put a glove on it yet. Uh, the, the the way the air circulated there and. In the daytime with the sun and, and everything else, the pop-ups were were an adventure, to say the least. Uh, no doubt about that. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that here a little later, about Candlestick. But uh, also, you have uh, you know, you entered a game one time, and I read a little bit about this, and I had somebody tell me about it. But you entered the game one time with the, uh, with a shirt that you had uh, the trainer or something put on there. You had Boo put on your back. Would you care to tell us a little bit about that? Oh, I'd love to. Uh, <laughs> I was getting booed pretty regularly, pretty hard. And uh, one night I was laying in bed and my wife just popped up and she said, you ought to just change your name to Boo. And you know, at that time it didn't dawn on me, but I thought about it and I, I finally went to our equipment manager and I said, I need you to make me a, bur a jersey with Boo on it. And he did. Uh, I let it hang in my locker for a couple of weeks before I built up enough nerve to, to put it on. But a utility infielder, Rob Andrews, was the only one that I knew that I, that knew that I was going to wear it that night. And I had my jacket on before they were announcing the starting lineups. And... As I was running out on the field, Rob Andrews, our, uh, our, was beside of our manager, was Joe Altabelli. And when I was running out on the field, he said that Altabelli said, what's he got Bob on the back of his jersey for? <laughs> but uh, I, got, I, I got to play uh, three outs in it. I only got to play in it defensively. Never got a bat in it because when I got back into the dugout, the general manager and the equipment manager were there with my regular jersey, told me to put it on. And the equipment manager had been fired because he had made that jersey for me. But later on, he was reinstated. And the general manager fined me $500 for being out of uniform. And But he, uh, all this stuff was going on. But when the game was over, where do you think every single reporter was at? I mean, every single TV station, every newspaper, I had more microphones in my face than you could shake a stick at. But here's the thing about it. Me doing a simple, crazy thing like that. The fans loved it. The media loved it. And it got them off my back. <laughs> That's a pretty cool idea. I really like that. And I read that and I was thinking, uh, how did he get away with that? So that was a, that's a pretty cool story. I love those stories. So I, I've seen that a picture of me batting on the internet. Somebody, I don't know what, how that got there. It's got trans and transposed somehow, but I never, ever got a bat with it on. That That's pretty cool. And, uh, you know, and I think it was 83, you was talking about your defense, but in 83, you done pretty good. I mean, you had over 100 hits and like 39 stolen bases in 83. Yeah. Uh, Frank Robinson was the manager then, and he he said in spring training uh, before the season started, he's, he said, you're going to be my leadoff hitter. And I, I about passed out when he said that. And But it was a really good year for me. When you're hitting eighth in the National League and you got the pitcher hitting behind you, if there's less than two outs, he's going to be bunting you over. If there are two outs, they don't want you to steal. 
because in case you get thrown out, he'll be leading off the inning. But when you're leading off, it gave me an opportunity <clears throat> to steal base. And, and Frank gave me the red light. He said, you go anytime you want to. So I didn't have no steal sign or anything of that nature. So I, I was just doing it on my own. Ended up stealing 39 bases. But, uh, yeah, 83 was a great year. I loved it. Oh, yeah. And that was, that was pretty good. Still 39 bases. Uh, you know, everybody's over here commenting about their loving your stories. Uh, Bob Irie, he wanted to know, was that third baseman, was that Bob Horner? That That's exactly who it was. Uh, he's never put a piece of leather on a baseball on a pop fly in, in Candlestick Park yet. <laughs> and, and, but don't get me wrong. I've seen Ozzie Smith and Davey Concepcion go out of that park shaking their head because they would go back on a pop fly. And I know you don't not going to believe this is true, but the ball would end up hitting in the dirt part of the infield and they would be 15 or 20 feet away from. Them. And those guys don't miss pop-ups, but that's what candlestick could do to you. Yeah. I remember watching a lot of games when the Reds played out there. And I remember sometimes the wind was so bad. I mean, you could see the ball, when they pop it up, you know, they would misjudge it big time. So, yeah, I, I could tell how bad it was. Uh, there had to be a nightmare. So we've got uh, – It was all fun. Oh, yeah. And you're you're also on the uh, San Francisco uh, Giants Wall of Fame. How many guys are on that and, and what's, the, like, the criteria to, to get on that uh, Wall of Fame? Uh, how many there are on it, I'm not sure – I was yeah. out there looking at all of them uh, about a year and a half ago. And I think there's probably about 50, something of that nature. But part of the criteria is that you have to play at least eight years in the Giants organization. And uh, the other criteria, I don't know whether you get voted on or, or what of that nature, but it, it's, it's an honor uh, to be on that wall and to have your plaque put up there on the, on the stadium wall and people can walk by and look at it. And they, they see McCovey and uh, they see Mays and uh, they see Marshall and Cepeda and, and lo and behold, there's, there's Johnny LaMaster. I'm on the wall, baby. That's pretty cool. I mean, there's not too many people in the world can say that with the, you know, not that many there on the wall. So that, that has to be something that, you know, that you can never, ever forget about. I mean, that's just, that, that would blow my mind. It's, it, it's an honor. There's no doubt about that. And it's something that, you know, you, you want things to be done before you pass away. You don't want to put, have your thing put up on the wall after you're already gone, but something that you can see and let your kids see and let your grandkids see. And, and it's, it's, it's been a, a fun thing to, to do and go through. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. Uh, Kevin Gray, Beachwood coach. He said, we have a youngster of Beachwood named Barrett LeMaster. Any relation? He said, I hope so. <laughs> he is. Uh, his father is my nephew. Uh, and I know Barrett well. And I'm, I'm coming down there to do a baseball clinic in the last week of November. And I haven't told Barrett yet, but I'm going to bring him with me. There you go, Kevin. You heard it here first. We're we're exclusive. We're better than NBC, CBS, and ABC. Um, I am Barrett's great uncle. Is what I am. There you go. That's pretty cool. Uh, was there? I was going to ask you too. Do you ever like? Uh, do you still keep up with your teammates? And do you go back to like San Francisco for events through the year much anymore? I do. Uh, believe it or not. They've had two Johnny LeMaster nights there where they put my picture on the, every ticket that sold there. And wow. the night that uh, we had the uh, Wall of Fame thing, I went out. Uh, there was another night that they had every single, or they invited every single person that had ever played it uh, in San Francisco as a giant when the first game was played at the new ballpark. And that was really exciting, too. And I was able to take four of my grandsons with me the last Johnny LeMaster night that they had there. And 
uh, we did San Francisco. We painted the town red. That's pretty cool. I mean, to be able to go back and know that you played that many years and they've got a night, you know, named after you. I mean, and you do that a couple of times a year or, or whatever. That That's a pretty cool thing. Uh, somebody was asking here, Kelly Ish and Bentley, she was wanting to know why it was so difficult to catch those, uh, those there. She talked about the fly balls. We kind of explained with the, the wind and everything. You're right there by the bay and you had all that wind coming off the bay. So it was really hard to catch right there, wasn't it? Well, it was a swirling wind. It wasn't a wind that just blew in one direction. And it would, it would just like, almost like a small tornado and it would take the ball left, right, and then back. And then you put that with the sun up in your eyes and it, it I've seen people just absolutely miss balls there that you knew it was a can of soup in any other ballpark. But it wasn't just one person. I've I've seen great outfielders get messed up there. I'm talking about the best players in the world. And this ballpark could just flat wear you out. But it it, it was fun to watch as long as it wasn't happening to you. But it candlestick was just a it was a I don't know it and it was cold. The what the Water coming, the current coming down, it was coming down out of Alaska and the, and the wind blowing off the cold water made it even colder when the sun went down. <clears throat> in July and June and August, you'd see people in parkas and uh, down jackets because it was so cold there. <laughs> but uh, I don't, it, there's never been another park like it and I don't think there ever be another park like it. No, I remember watching it on TV and it'd be like you said, it'd be, July and August, people would be right there in jackets like it was freezing to death. And it was like the wind would, you know, was blowing every which way. And that that's another reason, you know, for you to be there for eight years or so. I mean, that's pretty incredible, just especially for your defense to even play at a park like that for that long. Well, we tried to use it to our advantage because we knew the visiting teams hated to come to Candlestick Park. They wanted to get their – three game series or four game series and get out of there. And a lot of times you'd see some of the best players off the other teams would take a couple of days off just because it was candlestick park. And the only person that never took a day off was uh, Steve Garvey from the, from the Dodgers. But a lot of most of your other great players on every team that was going would take at least one day off whenever they come to candlestick. That right there is very interesting too. And, to think about Steve Garvey, that's pretty cool there. So do you keep up? Do you still keep up with some of your former players and stuff? you still keep up with everybody? Well, we do. We try to. Uh, I just talked to Mike Keith yesterday. talked to Daryl Evans a couple of days ago. Uh, and, you know, sometimes when you go and play in golf tournaments or you go back to Candlestick or something like that, you, you get back involved with them and you either – texting them or emailing them or uh, doing Facebook with them or something of that nature. So was there any particular picture that you just dreaded to face? Oh, I'll tell you a story. Uh, yeah, the first game I, I played in, I hit an inside the park home run. Okay, we had, it was the last game of that series. The next day, we fl or not the next day, but that same day, we fly out. We have to go to Houston. And the next pitcher that I faced was J.R. Richards. And most people don't probably don't even remember that night, but he was about 6'9", six, 6'10". Six, and, you know, used to, you'd think 100-mile-an-hour fastball. Most people don't even, you know, what in the world is that? But in the, in the Astrodome, they had a radar thing up there. This guy's throwing 101, 102. And... But he was the next pitcher that I faced. And I walked up there, and, I mean, he threw three fastballs just by me. Boom, boom, boom. I'm struck out. I come up the second time, and there, there's a catcher by the name of Cliff Johnson. I don't know whether you remember the him or not. But he squatted back there behind home plate, and he looked at me and up through his mask, and he said, hey, Slim, I kind of like you. What kind of pitch you want to hit? 
I said a change up. <laughs> And he's he's back there flashing signs. Jr. is out on the mound shaking his head. He flashed some more signs. Jr. is shaking his head. And then Cliff looks up at me again. He says, well, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good right there. But Jr. was, he was awesome. He had a 100-mile, but he had a 90-mile-an-hour slider that he could throw out on the black part of the, outside corner that, and you couldn't really afford to lean over the plate because he busted that fastball in on you you're going to be hurt but uh, oh, man. he and his fastball was not straight either it oh. moved but the, there was another guy on that same pitching staff his name was nolan ryan and they could both throw it up there over 100 but uh i hated facing jr worse not facing anybody but when he when he released the ball, you could smell his breath. That's how close it felt like he was to you. Yeah, yeah, but I'd say you're right, and you, it's funny because different ones are asking me who I'm going to interview and and different things. And I said uh, the other day, I said I'm going to end it all with Nolan Ryan, which that won't happen. But that was just a joke. I said if there, I said that's who I'm. Who my goal is to interview Nolan Ryan on here. So you never know. <laughs> no, hey, Nolan's a great guy. Yeah, I, I guarantee if you got in touch with him or let him know, he he would probably do it. Yeah, I always liked him. I was a big fan of his when he played for Houston and then the Rangers. And I don't know, he's just – I don't know, he just throw the ball that hard. And I know he holds like the record. They stay for 108 miles an hour fastball. But, uh, yeah, it's just – he's unreal. So is there any uh, clubhouse stories that – struck you as funny that you could tell us that's uh, g rated <laughs> uh, i gotta keep it clean here uh uh there was a little utility yam filler by the name of uh what was his name uh what my wife's trying to show me a picture, but his name was Brad Wellman. I just now figured that. But okay. We were on the road and we'd already, there was like 10 of us that already had this all planned out. And then we were going around asking people, I'll give you a hundred dollars to shave your head. And he would say, no, nah, I ain't shaving my head for a hundred dollars. And another guy said, well, we'll give you $200 to shave your head. And Daryl Evans said, no, I'm not shaving my head for $200. And then they looked over at Brad. We already had him set up. And, it, you know, he's a rookie. They said, Brad, would you take $1,000 to shave your head? And he said, yeah, I'll take 1000 And as soon as he said that, there was $1,000 on the table. There in the oh, wow. The so we all got to take a turn shaving his head. But his wife just about killed him. His kid didn't know him. And it was awful, but uh, there was another one. When I was a rookie, my, my first trip to New York City, I'd never been to New York. They were trying to scare me to death on the plane flight and everything like that. But but anyway, we were going out to the ballpark the next day, and they, they said a couple of veterans said, come with us, we'll take you on the subway out to the ballpark. So I, I'd never ridden in the subway before. So we get on the subway and all of a sudden the subway stops. They said, we got to get off here. So we got off there and had to catch another train going another way. And they said, a couple miles on down the road, we had to get off again. And then all of a sudden, uh, they all got off the train one more time. I got off with them, but just as soon as the doors started to close, they all jumped back on. And I'm standing out there by myself, didn't know where in the heck I was at, didn't know where the ballpark was at. And I'm going to tell you something. In New York City, there are some strange looking people down there in that subway. <laughs> but I eventually found my way to the ballpark. But oh the, the, the next night, they said, we want to make it up to you. We're going to take you out to dinner. Uh, I said, okay. So we go out to dinner. Everybody's eating steak and lobster, and I mean, there's about 10 of us. Everybody's 
filling her oaks, telling stories and getting time. And all of a sudden, one person gets up and goes to the bathroom. And another person says he's going to get up and go to the bathroom. But before you know it, everybody has gone except me. I'm the only one sitting at the table. And they never come back. So who gets stuck with the whole bill? It's me. Yeah. But, and I'm, I'm mad. I'm mad as a horn. But the next day, <clears throat> going to the ballpark, I get to the ballpark. They have towels lined up all the way through the clubhouse, all the way to my locker. And then sitting there on my locker stool was, was the money to pay for that meal. But they got me pretty good. Hey, that's pretty good. At least you got your money back. I, that, that's some pretty cool stories. But, well, you know, from your teammates, but at least they took care of you. You wasn't out at the end there. Uh, we've got Edwina Baldwin. She says, I miss you. And then we've got Bob Irie. He says, when they chose the spot for Candlestick, the guy that owned the land showed Giants ownership the land during the afternoon when the weather was always beautiful. So they chose that location. But when the sun came, went down, the temperature would drop about 40 degrees and the wind would come off the bay. So whoever owned that and sold it to him, it pulled a, pro, a pretty good one on it. That Edwana that was on there that you talked to, she's my first cousin. She lives in Florida. So hello, Edwana. There you go. And, uh, you know, and then he was talking about J.R. Richard had a stroke in his prime. Scott Ratliff said J.R. was definitely a, a career that was cut way too short. Kevin Gray, J.R. was so good. Tra tragic what happened to him. And then Courtney Gorman was talking about good stories. So everybody, of course, everybody loves these stories because, you know, you lived it. We're just listening to it. Uh, it, it, it seems like yesterday. Oh yeah, you've had some, you've had some fun times. I can tell that, and uh, you know, you've got. Uh, of course, we talked about uh, candlestick and how bad it was. You know, with the the temperatures and everything, and your clubhouse stories. Uh, but playing at candlestick, are you? I mean, are you glad that you got to play there and you was a part of that history? I am. Uh, I. It was the big leagues, and yeah. as long as you're in the big leagues. There, I'm going to tell you something. There is nothing like it. If there's any young men out there that are baseball players, chase your dreams. Because the big leagues is where you want to be. Uh, and if you can get there, it's the, it, it's the greatest place in the world. No, nothing else even compares. Yeah. That's, and we love your stories. Brandy Laffeter said uh, – Great story. Bones is listening. Hey, well, I know her, and mm -hmm. Bones is her little boy, and he, he he may be one that ends up in the big leagues. That little fella can flat play. I'll tell you that. I've seen him play and watched him, and he he's maturing as a as a a, a great player. And uh, Kelly Bentley, she wanted to know who does Mister Lemaster think was the greatest player to ever play. Well, there's no doubt in my mind. Uh, I'm not, but the only thing that I, I as, that I played against is the only thing. I, if it's the greatest player, I would have to think about that for a while. But pound for pound, inch for inch, uh, it was Pete Rose. He came to play every day. Uh, if if my name was Joe DiMaggio, I'd go sit down beside of him in his locker, and I would say. I love the way you play the game. You play the game right. That's great. And and I agree with you. I mean, I didn't play against him or anything like that, but I watched him for years and and you know, they didn't call him Charlie Hustle for anything. So I mean he he was great. Uh and Kevin Gray, the Beachwood coach, said chase your dreams. That was great advice. Now, you know, after your baseball career and everything, uh what are you doing like your life now? I know you talked about missionary work and stuff. Yeah, uh, I do a, a lot of missionary work in Peru. Uh, I've done some in Africa. I've done some in Greece. I've been to India and done some missionary work there. Uh, and it it's something that I really enjoy doing. Uh, the young people may be out there listening now. Uh, 
and as me and you were talking earlier before the show started, uh, go out of the country for a couple of weeks to some foreign country and then come back to the United States of America and see what you got. We are so blessed uh, to live in a place that we live in. And we some, I, sometimes I don't really think we know what we've got. Uh, and But every time that I leave this country and go to another country, I come back and I just say, why was I so fortunate to be able to grow and grow up and live in a place that I live in? Uh, The United States of America is the greatest place on this earth. No, No, there's no two ways about it. But going out and telling people about God and about Jesus Christ is something I really enjoy doing. Yeah, no, and, and you know, it's humbling to me that what everything you've done, even after baseball, and you know, and I appreciate those stories too. And and thanks for doing everything that you've done. Uh, we've got Bob Ira here. He's asked also, uh, Johnny, were you playing in the game when they filmed a part of Dirty Harry during the Reds Giants game? I remember listening to that game on the radio when Marty mentioned what was going on. I, I could, you broke up on me a little. Say that again. He was wondering uh, if you was if you were playing in the game when they filmed a part of Dirty Harry doing a during a Reds and Giants game. Uh, I don't think I think that was a little bit before my time, uh, but not. I was in the first year that I played. I was in Great Falls, Montana, and they were doing. Uh, uh, he was going in and robbing banks and different things of that nature. I can't remember the name of the movie, but uh, they were doing one of his movies there in, in Great Falls, Montana at that time. Okay. Okay. And Scott Ratliff said that I've talked with Marty Brennan several times and he would always ask about Johnny. Scott, Scott Ratliff played for me. Uh, I, after my baseball days were over, and he, he was a great first baseman and, and I, I really loved the way he played too. But Marty Branham uh, married a lady from Ashland, Kentucky. And during football season down there, when I was coaching baseball at Ashland High School, uh, I would see Marty quite often. <clears throat> but every time that I went into Cincinnati or every time that Cincinnati came to Candlestick Park, uh, Marty and Joe Nuxall would either have me on a pregame show or a, 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 one of their shows after they got a postgame show. But they always did that because they knew I was from Kentucky and I had, there was a lot of listeners in Kentucky. And, uh, but Marty and, and uh, Ham were two of the greatest people that I've ever met in my life. Yep. And, you know, uh, uh, we do the – I was going to mention about the – diamond dinner that we do every year here in Vanceburg. We've done it for the last couple of years and that raises money for what we do with spinal cord injury research and also baseball high school scholarships and stuff. And every year, you know, Al Oliver comes up, Doug Flynn will be there, Don Gullett, Tom Browning, Ron Oster, Steve Delabar was here this past year. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of great guys that come up to that. And uh, this year we're going to move it to Maysville if the state allows to do that. But, you know, hopefully, you know, I know you got missionary work and stuff going on different times, but hopefully we can work it out. So maybe, you know, you can come up this year, Johnny, and be a part of it because we'd love to have you up here. That sounds like a winner to me. I'm always in for a free dinner, buddy. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And before I let you go, if you don't care, could you name some of the notable ball players that you play with? Because I know Willie McCovey, Darrell Evans, some of those guys, and, and who some of them uh, – Notable ones that you that really stood out to you, and also that's you know stuck around for a while and done some pretty good career numbers. Uh, McCovey was one. Uh, by the blue, I played with played with Joe Morgan, uh, played with Bill Madlock. He won a few batting titles. Uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, probably don't remember John Montefusco, the count. Uh, he was a, one of the better pitchers in that era. Uh, but uh, Billy North, uh, Mike Ivey, uh, 
uh, played with Manny Trio. If you remember, he was a good second yeah. baseman also. Yeah. Uh, Dwayne Kuyper. Um, but those, the, Larry Herndon played with. Uh, Jack Clark was a, a great player. He ended up getting traded to St. Louis and ended up having a, uh, finished his career there. But he, he was one of the better players that I got a chance to play with also. But uh, it's, you know, some of the guys that I played against were just awesome too. But yeah. it, it was always fun to come in and play against the big red machine because when I first came up, it was 75 and 6. And I was playing against Morgan and Rose and Bench and yeah. – Perez and uh, all those guys and it, it you know it was just like that, the story of my first at bat and then we went to Houston now who do you think yeah, I forgot to tell you this story okay. the next, we went from Houston to Cincinnati so I have to leave about 50 tickets for people coming from Paintsville Kentucky but the first game I ever played it was Three River Stadium man the first game I ever played there I hit another home run and it was off Jack Billingham, uh, if you remember him. Yeah. And he was a good pitcher also. Oh, yeah. And uh, I'd say there was a lot of people who came up to see you from Paintsville. I mean, that that's still it's a pretty good drive, but I'm sure once you got to play here in Cincinnati, Riverfront Stadium, people came up to watch you. It was pretty close. You know, you've got uh, Bob Iyer. He said Barry, Bobby Bonds. You played with Bobby Bonds? I I didn't get a chance to play with him. Uh, when I got traded to Cleveland, he was the hitting coach there. So okay. I, did get, I did get to spend some time with him. I was in spring training with Barry Bonds in 1986, his rookie year. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, I played with Stargell when I was on the Pirates. Uh, uh, let's see. Rennie Stennett. Uh, there was some – I can't remember the little center fielder's name. I'm getting too old to remember all these names. <laughs> well, they're pretty good names. We remember them after you tell us. It's pretty cool because you played for San Francisco, then you played for Cleveland some, you played for Pittsburgh some, and and then who else? There were four teams. I finished it up with Oakland. Gotcha. Gotcha. And uh, – how about Dusty Baker? Did you play with him too? I did play with Dusty Baker. Dusty Baker was a teammate of mine for three years. Uh, and then lo and behold, he goes and he's been a manager, I don't know, with the Reds, with the Cubs. Uh, and now he's hired back by Houston and they don't even get to play this. I, I was looking forward to see how he was going to handle all that cheat gate stuff and keep his players from getting hit and everything. But Dusty, Dusty's pretty good at that. Uh, I think he was, he'll end up doing a good job for the for the Astros and helping getting him getting them through this look because everywhere that they go, people are going to be all over them, especially in ballparks that uh, are not too friendly to them anyway. Bob Irie keeps coming up with these names. He said Ken Henderson. Uh, Ken was I didn't play with him. He was there before I was, but I, I did know him and I know of him. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, it's, it's really, we really appreciate you coming on tonight. Uh, Johnny, hopefully we can have you at Maysville this year. If we're allowed to do anything by November, December, we're waiting to see when the state allows. And then also when baseball season's over with, because, you know, we don't want to do anything while baseball season's going on. And I know they've talked a little bit about ext extending it. Then they've talked about not extending it, maybe 82 games. So, I don't know when we'll do it. We're just kind of waiting to see what happens with baseball. If it's up to me, I'm saying play ball. There you go. Good advice, good words. Thanks for being on tonight, Johnny. I appreciate it. Uh, text me anytime. We'll stay in touch, and, and we'll see if we can get you down to Maysville this year. All right, partner. You have a good night. And everybody right. that's listening, you all have a good night and stay safe. Yep, exactly. Thanks, Johnny, and thanks for everybody listening. Talk to you later, Johnny. Bye-bye.